أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The topic that is uh, designated for tonight is the topic of repentance. <clears throat> and since, likewise, today, Friday, was the martyrdom of our fifth Imam, Imam al Baqir, I'll also at the end speak a little about Imam al Baqir. Now when it comes to the topic of repentance, repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking Him to forgive us of our sins. Now there's so many things we can say, we can you know, write books about this, give many lectures about that. And I don't, I don't have too much time because it's only about half an hour or less and I want to speak about Imam al-Baqir as well. So I will just go over some brief points inshaAllah. I'd like to share with you a beautiful hadith about repentance. Many people they ask, will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me? I've committed so many sins and I have such a dark history. When I was younger, especially when we grow older, we become more wise. Sometimes we go closer to Allah and we're not very proud of our history. So we have these questions, will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me if I truly return to Him and ask Him for repentance or not? And like I said, there's so many hadith, so many verses, so many things that we can mention about this. But I'd like to share this hadith. There's a hadith from Imam Ali السلام, where he's narrated defining a true, sincere tawbah, repentance. If I repent in the way that Imam Ali السلام, says, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guarantees that he will forgive us. Because Allah says in the Holy Quran, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنِطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ he says, oh you who have disobeyed Allah, sinned so much, too much, do not despair, do not be despondent of the mercy of Allah. For Allah forgives all of the sins. He says, Inna Allah, Allah will forgive every single sin that you have, no matter how much they are. But Allah doesn't say in detail how I repent to Him. So that the hadith of the Imam explains to us, because if I want to repent to Allah, I have to be sincere about it and I can't be playing games and it can't be just a word I say and I don't mean it. So the hadith of Imam Ali, he says, ala arba'ati da'a'in. There are four conditions to your tawbah. Number one, he says, nadamun bil qalb. Number one, you have to be, feel sorry about what you did. You have, to have, you have to have that remorse inside you, feel guilty. If I'm proud about the sin that I did, of course Allah won't forgive me. So number one, it pertains my heart. I have to feel sorry and no one can fake that. Allah knows if I truly am sorry, if I truly regret what I did, I have that remorse and guilt or not. So number one, the Imam says, Nadamun bil qalb. I have to feel sorry about what I did. That's step one. Step two, the Imam says, وَاسْتِغْفَارٌ lisan. Number one, we said it's the heart. Number two comes the tongue, your mouth. Allah wants you to show it, express that you're sorry. Say, Ya Allah, I'm sorry. Say it, don't just think about it. Allah wants you to say it. Say, Ya Allah, forgive me. I didn't, you know, I wasn't thinking the right way. Or, or whatever, just tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are sorry. And don't make excuses. Don't say, oh, I was young, I didn't, no, no. Say, Ya Allah, I was wrong. I was wrong. And I want you to forgive my wrong. I want you to forgive my sin. So be straightforward with Allah and tell Him. Tell Him that all those sins that I did, no matter what they were, I feel sorry about that. And Ya Allah, I ask you to forgive me. And one of the best ways to do that is to read the du'as of Ahlul Bayt. So much du'as of Ahlul Bayt, they teach us how to ask for forgiveness. Especially if you speak Arabic. If you don't, read the translation. So beautiful. There is one munajat from Imam Zain al Abidin called Munajat al Ta'ibin. This is the dua of the Ta'ibin, those that want to repent. So beautifully, the Imam teaches us how to speak to Allah, how to ask Him for forgive, forgiveness and for repentance. So, this is number two. Number one, we said the heart, feel sorry. Number two, the tongue, say it. 
Number three, the Imam says, You have to make a commitment that you will never do that sin again. If I did a sin today, I say, Ya Allah, I'm sorry, I feel bad about it, but I know I want to do it tomorrow too. That's not a true repentance. I'm playing games with Allah. So I have to make a true commitment that I will never commit that sin again. If I did commit it again, it should be a slip. It should be a mistake, not intentionally. Or else if it's intentionally, that means I'm playing games. So this is number three. I have to tell Ya Allah, when I made that sin, I feel bad about it. I'm returning to you. I'm admitting that I did wrong, but now I want to come back to you. I want you to forgive me, and I promise if you forgive me, I will never do that sin again. It's difficult to stay away from the haram. It's difficult for me to resist my desires and temptations and the haram. But I will do it for you, Ya Allah. But I want you to help me. Ask Allah to help you. Tell Him to give you the courage, the tawfiq, the ability to say no. To always stay away from the haram. What displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And make that promise. Unfortunately, you find many of us when the holy days of the year come, like the days of Ashura, or the days of Ramadan, the night of power, the day of Eid, we turn to Allah. But what happens after that? Does it make a change in our life? No. You see in 40, 50 years, he attends Ashura program, Muharram, Ramadan program, but nothing changes. Why? Because we're forgetting about this. We're not making that promise to Allah that I want to change. As soon as those holy days finish, Ramadan, Ashura, we go right back to our old habits. We, we learn nothing from these programs. And if we do, we don't apply them. The third point, which is one of the most important points, is that we make a promise that we're going to make a change in our life. I'm not going to ask you for forgiveness and then go right back to what I, where I was. No, I ha there has to be a change in my life. I have to make that promise. This is number three. And finally, the Imam says number four. The fourth condition, if you want Allah to truly forgive you, He says, وَعَمَلٌ بِالْجَوَارِهِ You had the, so, the, the uh, sorrow or the, the guilt in the heart. And then you said it. And you made that commitment. Now Allah wants you to express it and show it through actions. How? How does one show through his actions that he's sorry? Let me give an example. Let's say I take a, a hammer and I break someone's car. Or let's say, I don't do it intentionally, but I crash into his car, but I'm in default. And leave the insurance out of this, let's say there's no insurance. And then I tell him, I'm sorry. Now, if I tell him I'm sorry, and I'm truly sorry, what would that mean? I would offer to fix it, correct? Let's say I break something in his house. Oh, I'm sorry, and that's it? No. I should at least offer to fix it, correct? I'll fix it, I'll pay you for it. So I have to show through my actions that I'm sorry. If I just say I'm sorry, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna pay for it. I'm not really sorry, correct? So any times with Allah, if I have committed a haram, I have wronged Allah or wronged an individual, I have to, what? I have to fix my errors. What do I mean? Let's say I never prayed for a few years. Now I want to pray. I return to Allah. I'll, I'll stay away from not praying. That means I'll always start praying. But the prayers that I missed, I have to make them up. If I make them up, Allah says, okay, this person is sincere. I'll forgive him. I have to start making it up, even if it takes a long time. At least start. Or for example, I never went to Hajj. I could go to Hajj. I had the money. I would always make excuses. Okay, I'm sorry. Go to Hajj now. Don't just say I'm sorry and not go, go to Hajj. Another example. I stole someone's money, or I took a loan from someone, and I never gave it back. I have to give people their, you know, their, uh, their money back. Or I have wronged someone in any way. I backbited against that person. I hurt someone's feelings, whatever. I have to go and ask that person to forgive me. Or if I can't, I, I can't reach that person, or it's too difficult and awkward, I have to do a good deed for that person, even if it's a small one. Five second good deed for him. For example, say, Ya Allah, I ask you to forgive that person's sins. So any errors that we make, we have to fix those errors. We have to make up for the sins that we made. Let me share you a story here with you. There was a man <clears throat> that lived a thousand years ago. 
His name was Bishr al-Hafi. He lived during the time of our seventh Imam, Imam al-Kadhim And he was a follower of Ahl Bayt, but he, was, he wasn't a practicing Shia. He was a wealthy man. His house was in Baghdad, in Iraq. And his house, every night he had a party in his house. He would bring slaves, he would bring women, dancers, alcohol, and you know what. So one night, Imam al kadhim when <clears throat> he was in Baghdad, the hadith says he was walking on, on a street, on a street one day, and then he comes across the house of this man. So the Imam begins to hear laughing and music, and you know, he, he knows that this, there's a party going on here. So the Imam is, you know, he's disappointed. So while he's passing, he sees a woman comes from the back door, and the Imam obviously could tell back then there were slaves. He could tell this is a slave, maybe from what she was wearing or because she was taking the garbage out. Back then only slaves would do that. So anyway, so he knew she was a slave. So he, the Imam, he quickly asked her a question. He said, to whom does this house belong to? She said, it belongs to my, my master, the man that owes me. And he said, what's his name? She, she said his name is Bishop. So the Imam told her, is your master a free man or is he a slave? So she was like, she's confused. What is the Imam talking about? She didn't know who the Imam was. He owns me. He's my master. So how can he be a slave? A slave can't be a master. You're either a slave or a master. Right? So she told him that this house belongs to my master. The Imam asked her, is your master a slave or a free man? She told him, of course he's a free man. She didn't know what the Imam was saying. So the Imam told her, you're right, he's a free man. Because if he was a slave to Allah, he would have been ashamed to commit all these sins right in front of Allah. He's, no, he's not a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because a slave is obedient to his master. We are all servants and slaves of Allah. But look at what he's doing. When he said that, she was shocked. She saw this person is not normal. He's so holy. These were words of wisdom. So she quickly ran back and she told her master, Bishr, what she saw. Bishr, he knew this man cannot be except Imam al kabir He knows the Imam, he's just not practicing, he has the knowledge. So he knew no one has the knowledge and the wisdom but the Imam to say such beautiful words. So he quickly ran out, he saw the Imam's far, he started to run after him. And he told him to wait, the Imam just ignored him until he caught up to him. He told him, why did you say I'm not a... Why did you tell my slave that I am not a slave of Allah? Of course I'm a slave of Allah. I'm honored to be a slave of Allah. Every day in salah and in, in, in tashahud, do not we say that I bear witness that our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is what? Is a slave and a messenger of Allah. We say slave before messenger. Being a slave of Allah is the most honorable title and position. A slave of Allah because he's the only entity worth Worthy of, of worshipping and being my master. So he tells him, of course I'm a slave of Allah. The Imam tells him, no you're not. You're not acting like a slave of Allah. You're, at, you're a slave of your desires. What your desires want, you do. Your desires say, go this way, you go this way. I want to eat this, you eat this. Your desires are in control. Your desires are the master. It's not Allah. Allah is telling you, do this and that. You ignore that. Your desires want this and that. You follow your desires. So how are you a slave of Allah and not of your desires? He tells him, you are worshipping your desires. So when the Imam, subhanAllah, such men like the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, it just requires two, three words, two, three minutes, and, and that person will transform, he'll change. This man was so affected and moved, he went back, and he saw, you know, the Imam is right all these years, I'm committing all these sins, and I'm a slave of Allah. And I have completely ignored my master. How rude is that? So he quickly kicked everybody out. And they say, this man, Bishr al-Hafi, transformed completely from being, you know, the, the man that hosted a party every night in his house and being so disobedient to Allah. He transformed from that to being one of the closest servants of Allah. His house turned into a masjid. He, want, he would be the first one as, at the masjid. The last one to leave, the most holy person. He would always be carrying a subha and praising and glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, always praying so holy. Just a few words, a few lines completely changed it. 
So you see how this man, Mishra al Hafi, he felt bad about what he had done. All his life was a waste and far from Allah. Few words from the Imam, he felt that guilt. He turned to Allah and he made that transformation. He showed it. So he did not continue on transgressing and disobeying Allah and he changed his life. So if I, brothers and sisters, want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's grace and mercy, I want Him to forgive me and I have to follow these steps. Show the sorrow, say it, make that commitment and if I have wronged anyone or wronged Allah, have errors, I have to try my best to fix it. And as we know, one of the best, one of the best days or one of the best places where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives our sins is where? Is in Hajj. These are the Hajj days. Hajj will begin on um, Sunday. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the hadith speaks so much about the day of Arafah, which is the ninth day of the Hajjah, Sunday. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive every one of their sins, whoever goes and attends that place called Arafat in Mecca, outside of Mecca. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives that person of all his sins. But however, the day of Arafah is not just for the Hujjaj. The day of Arafah is a holy day for everyone. And I was reading a hadith from one of the Imams. He was asked about the day of Arafah. He said the day of Arafah is a holiday for us. It's a day of celebration. He calls it a Eid. And then he tells the narrator, he tells him this is a day of dua wa mas'al. Do dua on the day of Arafah. Even if you're not in Hajj, you're here. Do dua, just like the Laylatul Qadr. Correct? No matter where we are, we take some hours to prostrate, to worship Allah. Day of Arafah is, it's not as great as Laylatul Qadr, but it's very holy, very great. So on a day like Sunday, we should take the opportunity. There are some a'mal. There's a beautiful dua of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. There's a few prayers, there's a few things that are mentioned in the books of A'mal like Mafatih al Jannah. But most importantly, Tawbah. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. Because Allah is more inclined to forgive you, He's more lenient on such days. So ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to clear your history, make that commitment, and start a new page with the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember, brothers and sisters, the hadith of the Prophet says, if you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you, then be forgiving with other human beings. You know, there are certain people, they have so much hope in Allah that Allah will forgive them of their sins. But they themselves are so strict with other human beings. They will not forgive other people. If someone wrongs me, I won't forgive them. I won't forget. I won't forgive I'll hold a grudge throughout my life, my entire life. If I want to be like that, hold everyone accountable for anything wrong they did against me, then how do I expect Allah to forgive me? You want Allah to forgive you, you forgive other people. It's a, you know, it's, it's a mutual way, it's both ways. You forgive others, Allah forgives you. And that's why one hadith says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the hadith says, if someone does you wrong and he comes and he asks you for forgiveness. He says, I'm sorry, but you do not accept. And he's a sincere person. He's not just saying it. Then the hadith says, you will not attain my shafa'ah. The Prophet says, my shafa'ah, my intercession will not be given to those people that do not forgive. So if I want, shafa'ah is extra. Shafa'ah is, is, is a form of forgiveness from Allah given through the Holy Prophet and the Imams. If you want Allah's forgiveness, then forgive other people. And that's why you see the Imams of Ahlul Bayt are Imams. They would always, they were always so forgiving. Every Imam. Look at how much wrong was done against them. They would always respond with what? With good. They would always respond against evil with good. And likewise, Imam Al Baqir alayhi salam, which I mentioned today, was his, the day of his martyrdom. He was also full of mercy, full of forgiveness. One day a man, a Christian man, the hadith says, he sees Imam al-Baqir walking and he wants to insult the Imam. What does he say? He comes and he tells him, Ant al-Baqir, the name of the Imam, the title of the Imam, al-Baqir. Al-Baqir is taken from the root word, Yabqir, 
Yabqur means the one that sheds something. So why was he called Al-Baqir, the one who sheds or cuts? He was named this by the Prophet because he was the one that began to spread the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. So the Prophet called him Al-Baqir because he's the one that basically shed through knowledge. It's like knowledge was untouched. He opened knowledge and began to spread it. So imagine you have knowledge contained in one place. He shed it and spread it. So he, he, he was called Al-Baqir, the one who shed and spread. So this man is insulting them. What is he telling? He tells them, are you Al-Baqir? Baqir means a cow. He's basically, you know, making fun of him. Al-Baqir, changing it to Al-Baqir. So imagine someone comes and you have a name and there's a, you know, there's a similar name which is you know, disrespectful and someone calls you by that name. What would you do? Some people would start a fight, you go punch that person, whatever. Imam al-Baqir look at how calm, how forgiving. He tells him, no, that I'm not Baqir, I'm Baqir. You see, so easily, so nicely, the Imam acts in a serious way. He knows he's insulting him, but he corrects him. He tells him, no, I'm not Baqir, I'm Baqir. The man continues, he saw the Imam forgave him, he didn't say anything, but he continued. He told him, is it true your mother, and then he speaks against his mother. So do you know what the Imam does here? Can you imagine someone comes and he insults your mother? What would we do? This is when we're tested, this is when we have to show forgiveness. The Imam tells him, you know what, if you're right, if what you're saying is right about my mother, then I ask Allah to forgive him. But if what you're saying against my mother is wrong, and you're lying and slandering her, then I ask Allah to forgive you. Do you know how much, how effective this man was? He thought to himself, how patient, how tolerant, how merciful is this man? No matter what I do to him, I can't get him to you know, get angry and start a fight. He's so calm, he's so peaceful, he's so tolerant and forgiving. This is how the Imams of Ahlul Bayt and there are similar stories with many of our Imams, how they would come and they would insult them. The Imam would, would you know, respond with beautiful words. He would offer to help that person who's insulting him. Can you imagine if we all followed this method in our lives? How much peace would there be in this world? What a beautiful image would we give to Islam and specifically to the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt. Anytime someone insults me, I respond with nice words. This, these are the teachings of Ahlul Bayt And this is Imam Al-Baqir And the rest of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Brothers and sisters, our time has finished. Once again, I'd like to remind you of a few points. Uh, number one, like I mentioned, Sunday, the day of Arafah. Do not waste that day. It's a, you know, it's a weekend. And we, most of us know school or work. So at least do some a'mal. Read the dua of Imam Hussein. It's mentioned in Mafatih Jinan. Type it on Google. You'll, you'll get it in Arabic and English and, and whatever language you want or go on YouTube and you can hear it. And ask Allah for forgiveness. Do some good deeds. Read Quran, dua, dhikr. That's number one. Number two, Monday will be the day of Eid al-Adha. Um, and there is a salat. There's a salah like the day of Eid al-Fadr. It's mustahab, it's not wajib, it's recommended. But um, I encourage all of you to pray. Now, of course, if someone follows Sayyid Fadlullah, that will be Sunday morning. As for someone that follows any other marriage, it will be Monday. And I'd also like to remind you of next week. Next week will, will be Eid al-Ghadir. And inshallah, I'll be speaking at that... Uh, Program, I think it will be in Vintage Bed, correct? Which is right next door here, next Friday night. And I believe you'll have, you have to buy a ticket if you want to attend. It's a special program. Uh, Eid al-Ghadir, brothers and sisters, I'm going to mention this. is the most important holiday Muslims have. If I were to ask you, what's the most important holiday you have? We would probably say they have Eid al-Fitr, right? Wrong. The Imam's numerous occasions, they would always say the greatest Eid for you, Shia, it's not Eid al-Fitr, not Eid al-Adha, it's Eid Ghadir. Unfortunately, we Shia do not reflect that. Eid al-Ghadir, we're so happy because no more fasting. Eid al-Ghadir, you find half the hall is filled. Or you don't find all the centers commemorating. Or Shia are not that happy. We have to show that this is the number one holiday for us. It's the day when it, Imam Ali salam was appointed as our Imam Khalifa. And the story of Ghadir Khum that I'll mention inshallah next week. So I encourage you, number one, attend. Number two, even if you don't attend, or if you attend, treat that day as a huge holiday. I mean, show it. 
However you spend your holidays, show that this is the greatest holiday out of the year for you.